Well, I'm going to start in the book of, of the book of Acts, as you guys know, and we're going to be starting in chapter 16. We're going to look at some verses from that chapter today. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there. If you don't, verses are on the screen for you, so you can uh, feel free to view those. I'm going to be referring to some other verses and passages uh, as I give a little bit of context and background to catch us up from where we were last week as well as what happened in between from last week and where we end and today where we pick up. Because the book of Acts is long and um, I'm not going through every single verse of every chapter. I'm trying to capture for us and, uh, and, and put into a capsule uh, the, the highlights, the, the main points of the book, and specifically the, the passages and accounts that the Spirit puts on my heart to preach and teach concerning. Because there's so much. I mean, it is packed with action. And remember, that is what the book of Acts is. It is the book of action. The acts of the Holy Spirit through his disciples, his followers, his church. That's what it's about. If Christianity is about anything, it's about action. There's a football player, uh, you know, he's a brother from the inner city, so he talks, you know, how, you know, my kind of people, you know. But anyway, his name is uh, Marshawn Lynch, and I don't even know if he's playing anymore, but really good running back. He played for the Seattle Seahawks and a couple other teams, and he would always say one of his catchphrases was, about that action, boss. He didn't talk much. And all, and you should, it's really funny. You could go on YouTube and look up Marshawn Lynch interviews, and it's hilarious. Because you know how reporters are. Oh, Mr. Lynch, Mr. Lynch, can you tell us about your game? You had 200 yards, and you did, 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 did. And he'll just, yes. Marshawn Lynch, do you think that you guys, no. Just one word responses. And then, so what do you think about, about that action, boss? God is about that action, boss. He's about that action. And uh, that's unfortunate for a lot of Christians or so-called Christians because, you know, we would like to, it's not about action, but it is. First, it's not. First, it's about God's work in us. But the whole purpose of what he does in us is to bring us to a place where we act. Where we act. There's action. Because faith without works is, I didn't say that, James the Apostle did, so get mad at him. Faith is what saves you, true faith. Action is evidence that you really have saving faith. And that's a challenge day to day for all of us, because it's easy to get comfortable. It's easy to get comfy in Christianity and to hide behind the powerful presence of God that happens on Sunday. But the reason he shows up here for us is so that out there when we meet the real world, when Ken goes out on the job and he's driving to Wyoming and work for customers, or when Blake does his thing, or when he's parenting, or when I'm with interacting with my spouse, or when Colin's training his customers, or when Shelly's doing sozo or selling her products, or when Olga's interacting, when Michael's leading his team, The whole point is that why he wants to heavily show up here is to give us the fuel, the inspiration, the power, and the courage to go out there and act. Act upon his words, his promptings, his leadings in our lives. And that's exactly what the book of Acts shows us. It's this amazing journey of the Holy Spirit like a wind According to Jesus says, he's like a wind blowing through the minds and hearts of his people, leading them to places they would have never gone on their own, leading them to people they would have never reached out to on their own, leading them to uh, uh, to things, journeys and assignments they would have never gone on on their own because the spirit of the living God always wants to move you out into realms that demand dependence and reliance on Him. God is not interested in you carrying out things that you can accomplish within your own means and your own strength and your own ability. So the Holy Spirit takes it upon Himself 
because he is the Holy Spirit after all. He's sovereign. He does whatever he wants and he blows wherever he blows. As, as John said, not John the Apostle, or excuse me, yeah, John who wrote the book of John, said, the Spirit is like a wind. It blows wherever it wants. Where it comes from and where it's going, nobody knows, but you do see the effects of it. You do hear the sound of it. You, I can look out, the, out there and I can tell the wind is moving on a tree. I don't know where it came from, nor where it's going, but I know it's working. Holy Spirit does that in our lives. Whew. Here's Blake and his family just blew up in here. Just, the wind just blew him here. They don't know. He made a decision. He had to make a decision, but that's the Holy Spirit. How did any of us get in contact with? No, none of us knew each other five years ago. I didn't know any of you people five years ago. And y'all didn't know me, except my, my baby and my family. But here we are, just chilling and eating Colorado at On Point Dance Studio. Just here. Just, what? As one of my old uh, high school football coaches, shout out to Mark Rogie. He saw me after like 10 years, you know. We, we kept in touch after a while, you know, and then, but just lit, this last year, maybe two years ago, I went over to, uh, he's coaching at a different high school and I kind of surprised him and some of the other coaches that I, that coached me. And I was just standing there and he saw me from a distance and he's, you know, getting older, but he's still hilarious. And he said, Oh, look what the wind blew in. And you got to know him and he's hilarious. But then he said, he knows the Lord. So he said, wait. Look what the Holy Spirit blew in. And, and that's how the Spirit moves. It moves like a wind. And so that's all through the book of Acts. And that's why there's so much action and movement. They're here. They're there. They're in jail. They're preaching over here. They're getting cuffed. They're getting beat. They're going. You can't keep up with the move of the Holy Spirit. And that's why I will not relent in my pursuit to be wholeheartedly submitted to the move of the Spirit in my life, my family's life, and in any ministry I ever lead. So if you are a part of this ministry, however long God gives us the grace to go on, however far he, we are going to be submitted to and, 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 and yielded to the Holy Spirit. And I need your help. I need your help to hold me accountable to the wind of the Spirit and the move of the Spirit. And I want to hold you accountable to that too. Romero, what's the Holy Spirit leading you to do? Well, I know he wants me to go talk to that person, but I don't want to talk to him because they're hard to talk to. I know he wants me to invite my, my, some of my guys over for dinner, but I want to watch the game. You know, whenever the Holy Spirit speaks, you got to try to discern what he's saying and then act as soon as you know it's time to act. So in the book of, in the, excuse me, in chapter 16 of Acts, we come to a unique passage, a unique part of the journey of Paul. Okay, so I know we're, we're getting there. We haven't read yet. Um, I'm going to read it and then I'm going to do a little backtracking and then run forward and finish the message with it for us. Okay, so I'm going to read verses 1 through 10 of 16. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. And as they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decision that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, and having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, and when they had come to up to Maesia, Mysia, I, read, I looked it up last night. I promise I did. My brain, don't make fun of me, all right? <laughs> I think it's Mysia, I think. There we go. Mysia. They attempted to go into Bithynia, but, all, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding, everyone say concluding, that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So this is a real interesting passage because in it you find a, a, another component of what the Holy Spirit does. And this is a component that maybe kind of annoys us or... Uh, 
makes us like kind of scratch our head at God. Like, wait, what? I thought you were God who, you know, just let me, you let me go and live for your glory and whatever I do and all that I do live for your glory. And that's great. But here you find what the Holy Spirit does with the Apostle Paul is he tells him no a few different times. But before I talk any more about that, I want to catch us up. So last week we finished, my message was ends to the ends of the earth. And we talked about how God, you know, set Paul and Barnabas on a mission, missionary journey. And we know that from the Jesus and his disciples, the Great Commission, that commission was to preach the gospel, make disciples of all nations, and not just in their own backyard of Jerusalem, but Judea, Samaria, unto what? The utter ends of the earth. And in the book of Acts, we see that process being carried out. And where we were last week, they, were, they had been set apart by the Holy Spirit and sent out. That was Paul's first missionary journey. We didn't even really get into that. Paul took three, some say four, missionary journeys all throughout that region over there, beyond Israel, beyond Jerusalem, in Asia Minor, in, in, in what we find in this area, or in chapter 16 and a little before, uh, is he's in the area of modern-day Turkey, surrounding that area, cities in that area uh, of modern-day Turkey. And again, um, so with that, after they got sent out on their first missionary journey, a lot of things happened. I'm just going to give you a couple bullet points. Again, I want to give you some teaching and some context so you can get the picture of what's, what's taking place in the book of Acts. So in Acts 14, um, in Acts 14, they end up in a city uh, of, of Lystra, and they heal a crippled man. Paul does. He sees a crippled man who was crippled from birth, and he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up to your feet and walk. And the man was healed. And all the people of Lystra, because remember, these are not Jewish people. They don't know the true and living God. They serve false gods. They serve idols. They worship the gods of like Zeus and those types of gods. And literally, the, the, the when Paul laid hands on her. I don't know if he laid hands on her. I think he just spoke to him. When this man was healed, they began to worship Paul and Barnabas as Zeus and Zeus's spokesman, uh, who was Hermes. They worshiped him and they bowed to him and they began to worship them. Oh, this is Zeus. Oh, hell God. Oh, Zeus, Zeus, Zeus. And this is chapter 14. And Paul and Barnabas, they don't know what they're saying because they're speaking it in their language. Someone interprets for them. And Paul and Barnabas say, hold up, hold up, wait a minute, hold up, wait a minute. Don't you worship me. Don't worship us. Uh-uh, this is not about us. You got the wrong guy. I'm not the one who should be receiving your worship. And that, my friends, is always a sign of true discipleship. A true apostle, a true leader, a true servant of God doesn't take the doesn't take the, the glory for himself, for herself. You always recognize what and who the source is, and it's always God. And Paul had to set them in their place, and this is what's his little sermon. He preached to them a little good sermon in there in verses 15 through 18. Listen to this sermon. It's real quick. He said, man, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you. We bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and, and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave them without witness, for God did good by giving you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your heart with food and gladness. So the message to these people, because they were worldly pagan, they did not know the, the true and living God, they had to speak to their idols. How many know that we live in a day and age where idolatry is still running rampant in our society? The idols might not be Zeus and Hermes as much as they are money, success, status, comfort, ease, pleasure, entertainment, athletics, you name it, in the worship of man. Our culture is, in a, is very steeped in worship of man. We elevate man above God. We worship the creature instead of the creator. And Paul simply says, turn from these vain things to the true and living God. And some of us need that message even for us as believers. What vain things are you worshiping? What vain things are you giving your devotion to that you care more about than you do care about God? Turn from anything that is vain in your life, vanity, emptiness. Worshiping a person is not going to supply you with anything of value. You worship God and Him alone. Okay, then in, then what happened from there is they preached the gospel in that city. And, and by the way, the people didn't stop worshiping them as Zeus and Hermes. 
And there Paul and Barnabas went to some of the other believers in Antioch. So they went back to Antioch where they already planted a church and already begun uh, preaching and teaching and growing that church. And what they did, and this is in verses 19 through 23 of 14, of chapter 14, they strengthened the souls of the disciples and encouraged them to continue in the faith. And this is what the one thing I want you to catch out of what they did here. So again, they returned to the city in which they already preached and began a church, Antioch, and they strengthened them. How did they strengthen them? By this phrase. Listen to this. They did, They said, by through many trials and tribulations, you must enter the kingdom of heaven. Listen, my friends, that word is true as much as it was then. It is true now for you and I. Yes, we have a, an inheritance in his kingdom, but it's not going to come without many trials and tribulations. Our Christian journey, our walk of faith comes with trials, tribulation, hardship, rejection, persecution, failure, delay, setback, Barriers that seem unmovable with many tribulations, you must enter the kingdom of heaven. If you want to enter into your inheritance and possession, you must understand and embrace that tribulation and trials accompany that entering in. Can you handle that? Are you willing to endure? Are you willing to embrace? Can you endure and persevere to the end? Because as Jesus said, those who endure to the end, will be saved. Endurance is the name of the game. Endurance is the name of the game. So many people really don't like to last to the very, very end. They start well, but they don't finish well. Everybody gets excited at the beginning. Woo, I love Jesus. He's so awesome. But then all of a sudden, they run into problems and they say, wait, what happened, Lord? And this, this can't be the Lord because it's hard. It's difficult. I tried once and the door didn't open. I knocked once. I asked once. Lord, so I, that's so they turn back. They're done. Please don't let that be you. But now you know. Through many trials and tribulations, you must enter the kingdom. Blood, sweat, and tears. You might have to get in crawling, but you're going to get in. Can I just prophesy over somebody here today? You're going to get in. There might be tears. There might be blood. There might be sweat. You might be maimed. You might be crip, you might be hobbling in, you might be crawling in, but you're gonna get in. Tell somebody around you, you're getting in. Tell yourself, tell yourself, I'm getting in. Woo! Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already. I can't get that high. Become to many dangers, toils, and snares. We, we've already come through, so we might as well. We've gone too far to turn back. God's, your past has prepared you for the trials you're going to face in the kingdom. Okay. That's not my message. Acts 14, 28 through, 24 through 28. What Paul and Barnabas had to do, which is really important for all of us, they had to rest and recharge. They had to get a little R&R. &R. They had to recharge, refuel, get encouraged, get strengthened up. And, um, and from there, they were sent out again. They reported to the churches and to the believers um, in Antioch where they began the journey. They reported to them um, what had happened up to that point on their journey. Okay, Acts 15. Okay, this is a very important chapter because in Acts 15, we discover a, one of the most critical doctrines. If you're a theological and you're doctrine and you love doctrine, the most, one of the most fundamental important teachings of all of Scripture that is revealed in the New Testament, New Testament is that we are saved by grace alone through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. That there is nothing else that you must do to be saved but believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Let me save you a lot of pain and turmoil in, in your inner person because a lot of religious people are going to try to slap on you other additional things that you need to do to be saved. You can't just believe on Christ. No, now you got to be baptized in water. You can't just be baptized in water. You got to be baptized in that denomination's church. You can't just do that. No, no, if you wear those clothes, you're not really saved. You have to speak in tongues to be saved. You have to do this to be saved and that same thing was going on back then because in chapter 15 some of the Jewish believers who were Jewish so they were still holding fast to their Jewish law to the the law of Judaism which had a lot of other things and one of their main things was circumcision and they were coming around the new Gentile believers talking about unless you are circumcised you can't be saved we know what circumcision is right they're saying you got to be circumcised or else you're not saved. And the apostles had to come and set the record straight that said, wrong, not on our watch, because Jesus Christ and faith in him alone is all a person needs to be saved and set free. So don't be putting these heavy burdens on the Gentiles. They don't need to be circumcised. They don't need any other thing other than faith in Christ. Can I get an amen? For anybody who's grateful that all you have to do is put your trust in Jesus. You can, you don't have to look a certain way. You don't have to perform any ritual. You don't have to do this, that, or the other. And anytime you start feeling that or you start hearing that, yeah, yeah, but you need to be careful because that's where legalism creeps in. And now you're going to be under bondage. We get baptized not to get saved. Because we already are saved. Makes sense? So whether it's baptism, circumcision, or any other ism. Chapter 15. So they had a whole council with all the apostles and the Jewish apostles. And Paul and Peter and the other apostles. They wrote a letter and they sent it out to all the other believers saying, "Here's that's not true. You don't have to be circumcised. But freedom within limits. Abstain from, you know, idolatry, sexual immorality, things polluted by idols, yada, 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 because those things will could hinder their spiritual growth as new believers. Okay, now we come to where I'm at today. So Acts 16, and it's going to be um, a nice, precise word from that uh, passage, verses 6 through 10 and 16. And uh, I'm going to read it again, just 6 through 10, not 1 through 10. And then I'm going to give my title and give you the word God gave us for today. And then they went through the region of Phrygia in Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. They had come up to, to, what did I say? Mysia. They attempted to go into Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing on, and now from there, I'm just going to um, summarize. Paul got a vision. There was a man in Macedonia. By the way, where is Macedonia? Europe saying in his vision, come help us. The title of my sermon is Red Light, Green Light. Red Light, Green Light. Anybody ever play that game? Red Light, Green Light. Red Light, Green Light. Red Light. Stop. Green Light. Red Light. Anybody? Y'all have kids. I was a PE teacher, so I played that a lot. And my subtitle is When No Means Yes. Ooh, those are some good titles. When no means yes. Wait a minute. We've all had parents. You know, parents come up with the the silliest, goofiest, corniest phrases that they think are going to make their kids really, you know, no means no, Johnny. And they do it anyway. (laughs) You know, whatever you know. Anybody ever had their parents say no means no? Or their teacher or their coach? Papa, dad, please. Blake, you ever said that? Son, no means no. But today... We're talking about no, when no means yes. Is there ever any circumstance with God where no means yes? Well, yes, we find that today. Because what we find very clearly is that Paul and his team of missionaries, they had a desire to go to Asia and preach the word in Asia. They wanted to go declare the word there, and they had made their plans. They had set their agenda. They had created their itinerary, and they were like, The Lord is all over this one. And so they set off to go to Asia, but it says that the Holy Spirit forbade them. 
Wait, what? Red light. Everybody say red light. They were like, they were just, we're going to Asia. Red light. What happens when God stiff arms you? <laughs> what happens when God gives you, you, remember, uh, hand to the, what was it? You know, hand to the, yeah, talk to the hand, you know, the face don't understand. But God, what happens when God puts the, puts the brakes on? Yes. Wait a minute, God, I thought, no, they, yeah, 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 no, no. God said no. God told them, no, but wait, that doesn't even, wait, God, this is a good work. This is a good work. They're getting ready to go proclaim the word in Asia. But how many people know that God's vision for your life is much bigger, better, and ama more amazing than your own vision for your own life? And how many people know that there is wisdom in embracing when God says no? Because if God says no, it always has a reason. God is an intentional God. He doesn't say no for no reason. Now, that's what we do as parents, don't we? I can't believe how I get sick of my own self. Sometimes I'm like, why do I, I just find myself saying no to my kids. And I'm like, why do I feel that that's my natural instinct? No. You know, God is a yes God. God is, a, if you know God, he is a yes God. There's a lot of yes space in God's uh, world in, in relationship with him. But there is no. I even talked to my wife, you know, I'm like, we got to really be intentional to say as yes as much as possible to the boys and only know when it's absolutely critical and necessary we got to tell them no. Because we don't want them to associate relationship with God, the Father, with this restrictiveness. But yet at the same time, the tension is that God is a God who also says no and he will restrict us from certain things. But he won't do it for no reason. He does it intentionally. And here's a situation where you find God giving an intentional no. But even when a child knows that their parents love them and that, you know, that they might have a good reason why, it doesn't make the no any easier to accept. And, and for most of us as adults, we still can't handle being told no. Anybody ever had a family member or somebody just flip out on you when you told them no? Or something like, wait, what? I have had people say, how dare you? You're supposed, ah, you had expectations that I'm supposed to just come and do, ah, da, da, da. learn how to say no. It's in the nature of God, so you better learn how to say no. Don't be a yes person. I got to work on that. Still growing in that. Got to learn how to say no. And God is not afraid to say no to his children. So Paul's like, Daddy, please, can we go to Asia? And he said no. He forbade them. That's a strong word. Forbidden. That's like forbidden fruit. That's like no, not like, no, not a good idea. Like, no, you're not going. Have you ever experienced when God says no? Have you ever experienced God giving you a red light? When you thought it was a green light? When you wanted it to be a green light? When you wanted to go? and you, But you knew in your spirit, you knew you got to check. You knew in your spirit it was a no. And anybody ever tried to still do it anyway? Talking about around that no and just keep going anyway. If you've ever done that, you find yourself getting into trouble. You find that you, you, you when you ignore the no's of God, you place yourself at, in harm's way or in failure's way or in unnecessary pain or in, un, you gotta, we got to learn to trust God. We trust God enough to hear him say yes, but do we trust him enough when he says no? Because that's really where it's tested. When we want something so bad, when we want someone so bad, when we want this idea, this idea that we formulate in our mind of what God is calling us to or what we believe is our mission or our thing or our thing, and God puts a, a red light and red light. But we have to also understand, again, the intentionality of God behind his no is not meaningless. The intention, anytime God will, says no to you, that's because he has a better yes for you. Anytime God puts the red light on, it is because he's getting, re getting ready to give you a green light somewhere else. Red light doesn't mean red light forever. Red light doesn't mean red light and no, no, no to everything. Red light means red light to that, no to that, but yes to that. And sometimes you have to go through the process of elimination of getting the no's from God before you get the yes. 
So my, my people, do not be discouraged when you feel like doors are closing in your face. Anybody ever felt like you can't get an open door from God? You tried this, it didn't work. You tried that, it didn't work. You knocked at that door, it didn't work. God, can you open a door for me? And you get closed door after closed door. Paul and his, his buddies here had two closed doors, two red lights right back to back, two no's right back to back. But God in his no was getting ready to give them a much bigger, greater, and better yes than they could have ever asked, thought, or imagined because their minds thought smaller and said, well, Asia, but they were already around, you know, no. but God was thinking, uh-uh, I'm sending you to Europe because the gospel is getting ready to hit Europe for the very first time, Paul, so no, no, yes, my no means yes, my no is not no just for no sake, my no means yes, and if You are going to effectively follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit in your life. And if you are going to effectively be used of God, you must understand and embrace God's nose. And you must be flexible enough to move with God when he reorders your steps and redirects your path. Because that's what he did here. He's like... Uh, Siri or the Google Maps person, you know, you take a, a turn that way or whatever, redirecting. It'll redirect. God will often redirect you and send you into something that you had not thought of because God is a good, good father who knows what's best for you and who knows what environments you will thrive in and who knows what relationships you will thrive in and who knows what people need you and what you have to offer. So God is going to formulate and and orchestrate your life in such a way where, yes, the no's come and they can be frustrating because you're trying to run full steam ahead and God says no, but then it's because over here he's got a yes. He Over here he's got an open door. Over here is a closed door, but don't get discouraged and kick the door and say, da, 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 da. no, open your eyes, look around because you're going to find an open door somewhere else. And this is the strategy of the spirit. And this is how the apostles in the early church were able to be so effective in what they were assigned to do because they did not hold their own plans and agendas so tightly that when the spirit said, I got something else for you, that they weren't able to do it. But that's the problem with us is we're so clung on to our ideas and agendas and plans that the spirit has something over here for us and we're not willing to to go or we're not willing to embrace the idea that there's something else for us. I'm preaching today. I know because it's quiet. Y'all are like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I wasn't, I was hoping he wasn't going to preach on this passage because I think the Lord just told me no the other day and I was trying to wiggle out of that. Don't wiggle out of his no. His no is the safest place to be. I know it. We hate it. My kids hate no. They don't like it and neither do your kids. Your kids don't like it. Your kids don't like it. Nobody likes no, but it's necessary. And I know a lot of people. Ken knows a lot of people, and I'm sure you know a lot of people, including ourselves, who tried to force their hand at something God had told them no to and live, had to live with the regret of doing it their way instead of God's way. God still loves you. You're still his child, but you're going to go through some pain. But praise God that Paul and his comrades said yes to God's no. You get that? Are you willing to say yes to God's no? Now do you understand why I'm saying the word that God gave me is when no means yes? When no means yes, and that is a lot. I've heard somebody say before, you know, when God says no, you know, God can give you one of three answers or something like that when you ask him for something. Yes, no, or not yet, something like that. And if it is a permanent no, then you better praise him for that. And don't try to kick through a door he has not opened. You need discernment in the mission he's called you to in this life. You need discernment in the people and relationships you're in. You need discernment. You need to be in tune at all times, and so do I. Asking the Spirit, constant dialogue. What what do I need to do here? Is this a good thing, green light or red light? Don't just barge into things. 
And it might seem silly to ask God about little things, but it's not. I'd rather ask him and not get an answer or ask him if you think, and it'd be silly than just barge into something just assuming and then he had something else for me. The apostles were so sensitive to the movement and activity of the Holy Spirit. And so after he got the two no's and the two red lights, he got a vision. I wonder if he would have got that vision if he would have just ignored God's prompting and done what he wanted to do. I doubt it. And who knows? The gospel may have never reached Europe. I'm sure God would have found a way to do it. Because God, if you say no to him, he'll find someone else that'll say yes. He got a vision of a man in Macedonia saying, come and help us in Macedonia. And Paul, when he saw the vision, immediately sought to go into Macedonia And this is very important, concluding that God had called them to preach the word there. There is sometimes in the leadership of God and his Holy Spirit where the best you can get to is concluding that God is leading you in a certain direction. There are times in his leadership that you will not have a 150% surefire, absolutely I know. But when you piece the puzzle pieces together like they did, well, he said no to there, no to there. Then I had a vision of some random guy in Macedonia. That wasn't just a rant. We're concluding. We're, we're, we're not assuming in a negative way, but we're, we're, we're putting the pieces together and saying, we're pretty sure it seems like God might be leading us there. So let's go and pursue that. And if God closes that door and puts a red light up as well, we stop and let him redirect us again. But how many know that God can't lead you very well when you are stagnant and not moving? God has a hard time leading people who are just sitting there. Get going. Start somewhere. Do something. And if you're going in the wrong direction, he'll redirect you. But he don't like people who ain't moving nowhere. Get moving. Bye. Bye, Felicia. Go. Get going out there. Start moving. Well, I wonder what the Lord wants me to do today. Well, if you don't have a clear direction, start moving. You know there's people he wants you to love. And then you know there's a gospel you can teach. You know that there are things you can do if you have no sense of direction. But the reason he was able to catch them and redirect them is because they had made the attempt. Because faith moves. The life of faith isn't always this nice, nice, neat, perfect, clean. I know God 100% told me I need to do that. And then I need to do that. And then I need to do that. And then I'm going to do that. A lot of times it's feeling it out, figuring it out as you go. I think I, I think I'm supposed to go over here. Or maybe I'm supposed to go over there. A lot of trial and error. But God is looking. He's waiting to see who's willing to step out. Audie, I love what you did with your businesses. You just stepped out and said, you know what? I don't need to why, why, wait for what? You, you stepped out. And maybe God says yes to all those. Maybe it's one of those. Maybe it's none of those. But you'll know eventually he'll direct. That, how, did this, how did you get into what you're doing? You had to step. You had to act. You had to move. How did we? Same thing. All of us. And God wants movement because with movement he can do something. But with stagnancy... You can't do much. All right. So stand to your feet with me. We're going to come to a close today. Worship team or worship member today. <laughs> you can come up. Yeah. Boop, boop. Boop, 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 boop. So this word, tuck it away. When no means yes or red light, green light, tuck it away in your spirit. Tuck it away in your back pocket because you're going to have to refer to that again. You're going to face situations like that. If you haven't yet, you're going to face them. And you're going to have to know how to handle it and deal with it. That when God is putting a red light, he's going to give you a green light somewhere else. So be prepared for that. In my own life, I have a prime example. After I got the word from the Lord in faith to quit my uh, teaching jobs, quit my delivering pizzas before before I even moved to Colorado Springs, 
I think uh, I think that was the first, second, the first time to start my journey in ministry. I was dead set. This is literally a, 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 this scenario happened in my life. I was dead set on I knew God or, or I knew I had a call to ministry, but I knew I had my student loans and I had got introduced to Dave Ramsey and I got on my Dave Ramsey kick and I was like, I'm getting out of debt before I do anything. I don't care how long, what it takes. So I'm like trying to, I was, at one point I was working three jobs and that didn't work. So I had to go back to two. But I was substitute teaching and delivering pizzas. And I was in it, man. I was my, my envelope system. I was doing, I was, I was so into it. And I was making a decent amount of money between those two. And in the middle of that, God interrupts me and speaks more, almost more clear than I've almost ever heard him speak. He said, what are you doing? I said, what you mean what I'm doing, Lord? He said, what are you waiting for? You know what I've called you to. Why have you not stepped out? I said, well, well, Lord. And I said, oh, ministry. And I assumed or I, I had believed that I was going to be going to seminary. And so I told the Lord, well, Lord, when you give me a full tuition scholarship, that'll, then I'll know and then I'll go. And he said, no. You go and then you'll know. <laughs> you go and then I might provide you with a scholarship. Don't be talking about when you give me a scholarship, then I'll know. That's not faith. That's living by sight. So I was like, oop, you got me on that one. That was my big aha revelation moment of what faith really was. Because faith is the evidence of things unseen and the substance of things hoped for. So in faith, with nothing, no money, with no sign or no signal other than the Lord tell me, what are you doing? I stepped out. I quit putting my two weeks notice. And then I was going full street, full steam ahead, 100% to seminary. I applied. I knew I'm going to Dallas Theological Seminary. Went home that night and started applying midnight. I had a roommate who we didn't really know each other. I found him on, you know, on the Internet. He was a student at UNC. I come home and I'm like, he's like, what is happening? I'm like preaching him and just all excited. I'm like, the Lord called me. I knew it. He spoke to me. And I said, I, and he's just like, oh my, yeah, okay. And I'm like, I got to apply tonight. I'm applying for Dallas Seminary. I'm going, I'm calling, texting people the next few days. Hey, can we meet up? You know, I'm, I want to talk to you about an opportunity. Support me as a mission, as a missionary, because I'm going to Dallas Seminary. And the people are like, oh, have you been accepted yet? I'm like, no, 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 but they're going to accept me because this is what the Lord has for me. Of course. So, you know, you could, and they're like, well, okay, maybe let us know when, when you get the acceptance letter. And I'm like, well, I'm going to get it. So anyway, so sure enough, a week later, I opened the letter. Uh, we're sorry. You have been rejected from Dallas Theological Seminary. And I'm like, hold up. I know, Lord, you spoke to me. I know you told me to. Oh, you closed that door. That hurt. I cried like a baby for about 15, 20 minutes on my couch. I said, Lord, I know you spoke to me. Why is that door closed? Why did you give me the red light? I know it. And then I just sat in peace and I waited. And I just said in my spirit, I said, I know that you've got something else up your sleeve. And I'm just going to wait for that. Bring, bring the next day. A couple days later, some Calvin, it's Will from uh, Church of the Rockies in Colorado Springs. How you doing? A family, uh, a, man, a husband and father of a family that I was really close to when I lived in Colorado Springs the first time. And I was the children's, one of the children's leader for the kids. He had like six kids. They, we had a really good connection. Uh, hey, would you be interested in being a children's pastor? Green light! Yes, I would. Okay, I'll do it. Yeah. How much am I paying? Uh, Fifty bucks a month. Okay, good, great, got it. Yes, yes. The answer is yes. The answer is yes. I'll do it. God closed that door. God gave me a no in one area, and it did hurt, and it did sting. But I was had enough. Just enough faith to believe, to say, God, uh -uh, I know I heard from you. So that must mean you got a green light coming somewhere else. So I'm going to go ahead and put my foot on the gas just real quick. I'm not going to step on it yet because the green light hadn't turned. But I'm going to put my foot right there on the pedal because I know when that green's coming, I ain't missing my opportunity. I ain't missing my green light. Because how many know if you get distracted at a red light and then it turns green, you on your phone looking at the pretty person next to you, talking to somebody, getting mad at somebody behind you, you might miss your green light. 
and it might go through the cycle, and you might have to be at another end. Sometimes God has got a green light, but it's not going to be very long, so you better keep your eyes ready for it because it's going to happen. If you get distracted in discouragement because of the red light and start looking down, the green light might flash over here, and you might have missed it. And so, because of that, I moved to the Springs. I ended up meeting my wife. I ended up being a children's youth and young adult pastor. I ended up being the right-hand wingman to my, to, to my favorite pastor I've ever had, who was a spiritual father for me for two years. It was him who spoke senior pastor over me. And, and, and it was there, and it was that season where God gave me the vision for Offspring Church. And it was there where God gave, built me up into the man I needed to be. He said, Calvin, yes, seminary was great, but it wasn't for you. I had something else for you over here. And he trained me, he trained me, raised me. And then all of a sudden, that church closed. Another red light out of nowhere. No, God, what happened? Me and him envision the future together. Da, 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 da. And then I hear I'll start off Spring Church. It wasn't that clear and it wasn't that fast. But over the course of time, we concluded that God was calling us to start off Spring Church. And so we started in a house with a bunch of people. But that wasn't off Spring Church. It was just a house church. I wasn't the pastor. But we were just doing what we didn't knew what to do with it. some young adults. That grew. And like, what is this? Uh-oh, why is this growing bigger than we expected? And we don't know what to do. We need a pastor. We need a vision. Da, 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 da. And that's where God started giving me clarity about the vision for our Spring Church. And then I spoke to everybody because everybody was divided. And we need to be small and do a house church. We don't want to be a real church or a big church or a pastor. Everybody helps. And all of a sudden, the elder guy was like, somebody needs to have a vision here. Who got the vision of this? And I'm like. Because I'm, I'm the one who called everybody to meet up and said, we got to start meeting somewhere. Let's start meeting. And they're like, yeah, let's do it. And so I'm like, but me? <laughs> I said, but I didn't say, I didn't say, mm-hmm. I said it boldly and clearly. Rebecca and I were engaged and I said, right now we're engaged. But upon marriage, God has called us to start Offspring Church and be the pastors. Why he chose us, why he called us, I don't know and I don't care. But I know he's called us, and therefore we have to go forward with that mission. And if any of you are feel called to follow and come along, please do. And if not, amen, we bless you, we move forward. But we must move forward because we got the green light. 